Hello, this is Melvin Kenny, and I am your host for Let's Get to the Core. Our guest is Andy McCloy, who is the owner of VCI Sports Performance and Fitness, located in Madison, Alabama. Andy McCloy has built a successful sports performance business with the purpose of helping local athletes b develop their athleticism so they can get out of their rough neighborhoods and to prevent them from living the same setbacks that he experienced in those rough neighborhoods. Andy McCloy is a well-known strength coach who is going to share with us some business principles so, they, so you guys can live a purposeful life but also have a purposeful career. So let's not take too much time and let's get to the core. All right. Hello, Andy. How are you doing? How's everything? I'm good, man. I'm doing well. Doing well. Cool. How about you? I'm good. I'm doing good. It's really good seeing you. It's been a while. So uh, yeah. it's been a while. We, have, we really had that Zoom call. So yeah, it's, it's good to, it feels good to see you again. Indeed. Likewise, brother. Likewise. So, yeah. So welcome to Let's Get to the Core. So the reason why I have you in the show is because uh, you have a lot of experience and most, um, I think the cool thing about you is that you taught me that, yes, there's a time for the grind, but also you, you need a life also out, outside the racks. So that's why I wanted you to share a little bit of some of your experience and some of your knowledge. So that's why I got you here. Yeah, man. Anything I can do to help you get that message out, I'm all for. So I got you. All right. So let's get to the course. So um, yeah. before we start with the, like all the, the, the questions, could you just give a, a little background of who, who is Andy McClure? <laughs> Yeah, how how deep you want me to go on all that? You know, uh, you just kind of like, talk about like where your, I am today, or I think it'd be uh, it's inter it'd be interesting to to share about your upbringing because it's a bit dif different from other people that are that are in the field. I, I, let's say unorthodox, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, I've always was into sports and strength training. I kind of realized early on I was probably not going to be uh, a towering, imposing figure. You know, my mom's five foot, my dad's five nine. Mm -hmm. um, I had a doctor break my heart at a very early age and tell me that I probably was not going to be six, six, like I had always planned to be, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I was a very competitive athlete. I was a good athlete. Um, I always loved sports. Uh, but I found my way into a lot of trouble. A lot of my identity was attached to my sport performance. And as I was transitioning into high school, I was able to go to one of the best high schools uh, in the entire country in the United States. And uh, very shortly after that, I kind of squelched that opportunity. I, I really I ruined it by by being a knucklehead. Mm -hmm. And when I realized when I came back home, there was like there was this, and I'm, I'm realizing this in hindsight, there was an identity shift. You know, the, the guy that looked at himself as an athlete and wanted to be an athlete, I started looking at other ways to fill that bucket of significance. And. I found myself into a lot of trouble and that, that stuck because I was, I was good at it. You know, it filled that uh, bucket of significance, although I was doing things that deeply conflict uh, with my current values. Um, however, uh, when I was 16 years old, still very early on, um, I became a father and I would love to say that that was the switch that changed everything for me, but it just wasn't. Um, I was too young to realize, um, you know, kind of what I had myself involved in, and I was still driving a lot of my significance from those experiences. Uh, however, it did plant the seed that um, I'm not just responsible for myself anymore. Quite literally, I'm responsible for another human being. Yeah. And that did start a very uh, slow shift into me. But, uh, you know, about 17 and a half, 18, I met a guy uh, in a Gold's gym where I was working out, and he owned uh, a company called HBI Fitness, Health, Body, and Image. They were uh, in Northern Virginia and all over Maryland, where they had contracts at all the Gold's gyms owned by John and Kirk Galliani. They were the owners of corporate licensing for Gold's at that time. Yeah. And he had a similar background to me. He'd been in trouble. He had had a, you know, a kid at a young age, but he really made something of himself and was running a really good company, making a lot of money. And to, to my young eyes, he had everything that I defined as successful. He drove a Range Rover. He had an incredible condo. He had a motorcycle. Um, appeared to have lots of money and friends and, you know, women and all these things that are appealing to you when you're young. Yeah, and sure. uh, I immediately kind of latched onto that. I was like, I, I can do that. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do that. And I realized at first I had to become a, a trainer first before I was just going to start a business. So that, that started my journey into being a trainer and a coach and learning about nutrition. And uh, this guy's name was Eric. He hired me and uh, very shortly thereafter made me the director of nutritional services for that company where 
I traveled around to all their locations and basically ran this software called Apex. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, at night I'm driving home to Indian Head, Maryland, where I'm living in the projects with, you know, my daughter's mother and my daughter. And um, I'm not seeing a lot of opportunity because of what I've surrounded myself with. You know, I, a lot of my friends were involved in illegal things and just everybody in my circle just was very good at getting in trouble. And uh, I kind of saw the writing on the wall that it was definitely, I'm going to follow the same path if I don't get out of here. Yeah. So at about 21 years old, I decided to pick up and move my family down to Alabama. And that, you know, probably saved my life uh, in many ways. And it, it certainly gave me an opportunity to start with a clear slate. And uh, after about a year of fumbling my way through trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I just went down to the local Gold's Gym and decided I was going to be a trainer. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went really well, gave him my fancy dancy ACE certification. You know, I was super qualified at 21 years old with no experience. <laughs> Luckily, my, uh, my ignorance was bliss, and I just kind of jumped in with two feet and uh, did really good. And within a year and a half, I took over that entire gym. Uh, I negotiated an exclusivity contract with the owner of that gym where all the training had to go through me and my company. Mm -hmm. And I replicated that at a couple other gyms. And, uh, you know, very shortly into my uh, ownership as a, as a business owner, I'm making a lot of money and I yeah. uh, got a lot of free time and I had no clue what to do with it. So I did what any young 20 year old does. I went to strip clubs. I went to bars, <laughs> traveled, yeah. and uh, I spent the money as fast as I got it. But, uh, you know, a couple of years into that, although I was doing well, I just really wasn't fulfilled. My entire life, um, was kind of wrapped up in just the pursuit of chasing money. It really wasn't anchored to anything. And, but around 2004 ish, I met a coach who uh, had became the head coach of a, a local sports team. Yeah. This is also around, and when I say sports, I mean a high school team. Okay. High and, school. Um, you know, this is right around the whole sport performance, like kind of industry started bubbling early two thousands is when it really started. And um, I was able to capitalize on that. I was ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. um, I had, been deep into studying, you know, all models of periodization and uh, really felt like that was kind of the next thing for me. Okay. Instead of just building a franchise prototype that was general fitness oriented, I wanted to kind of pivot and just work with athletes. I thought that a lot of my personal experiences growing up would fit well and mentorship essentially became, you know, my purpose. I realized that I could pay forward a lot of the lessons that I had learned and um, try to impact young men at an age where if somebody had came into my life, uh, I feel strongly they could have saved me from a lot of the trouble that I found myself in. And so I pursued that for years while I concurrently uh, started building a sport performance business on the side. Mm -hmm. And my relationship with this school allowed me to run an overhead free business, test out my model, work with athletes from all over the area. Yeah. Uh, we even ran a combine preparation program out of there to help multiple guys uh, get drafted into the NFL. And, uh, you know, after a long time of, of doing that and working as a high school strength coach concurrently, I just decided to open a facility. And, um, you know, that's I was probably 12 years in business at that point before I even got to really opening my facility. And I guess that was about eight years ago. We've been in this location now. We work with most of the elite athletes um, in this area from seven years old all the way up. There have been many professional athletes uh, that grew up in my program as middle and high school athletes that are now in the NFL, NBA, uh, Major League Baseball. Um, and, we, you know, we, we train savages, man. I mean, I benefit from geography. There are a lot of incredible athletes here. Mm -hmm. And specifically where I'm at, there um, are a lot of families that are heavily invested in making sure their children get uh, the best opportunity possible. And we've been able to work with some incredible kids and some incredible families and help them pursue their dreams. I think the cool thing, uh, the cool thing with like your story about seeing like how you were saying like you were knucklehead and then from there you were in training and talking about, okay, you were really into the business, but you, but now you kind of shifted away. You shifted more into, you know what? Uh, I was a knucklehead, but I'm going to take the lessons of my past and then trying to help those athletes in your community so they can, so they can become like better people. And I yeah. think that's, that's a really cool thing for, um, from their story. So that's why I wanted to, you to say that story. No, well, I, I appreciate that. And um, I would love to say that was the game plan from the beginning. Right. But I think a lot of times we figure stuff out uh, going through the process. I think a lot of people try to figure out exactly what they're going to do and what their mission is and what their purpose is. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they, then they'll take action, right? Like once they figure it all out, 
Um, and in my experience, that uh, can prolong you becoming successful and finding your purpose. Mm -hmm. So for me, it was just jump in, you know, lead from you know, like my heart. Yeah. Make sure that I'm very clear on well, my values. And then my purpose and mission kind of showed up for me. Okay. But it took me exposing myself to different types of work, uh, different types of people for me to have kind of this awakening where it was like, no, this is, this is what I'm meant to do. Yeah. And um, it's been incredibly impactful in my life. And that's why like this next stage of my career, I'm wanting to pay that forward for, you know, other coaches as well. Coaches who want to learn how to build businesses um, as opposed to just being a coach, which I, I have deep respect for the coaching profession at all levels. Yeah. I think it's one of the best jobs in the world. It is. I often think it's, um, it's one of those industries that uh, some people can just become overworked and underpaid and celebrate the struggle. And uh, I want to give guys opportunities to uh, become entrepreneurs and develop a lifestyle that not only makes them fulfilled and happy, uh, but also provides them with the freedom and you know, profit to allow them to enjoy life at the highest level. That's cool. That's cool. So, um, so since you, um, since you didn't really go to like college and there wasn't like a, let's say, uh, let's say a system to be like, okay, um, you didn't follow like a system to learn about strength and conditioning and about business. I'd like to know, like, how did you manage to study like all areas of business and, and strength and conditioning with books and con continuing education? Yeah. I mean, I think I've just always been a really curious person. Um, and I know how to find gold. I talk about this a lot. Like I know how to find the best people uh, in different areas and industries. And yeah. then I will pay them, mm -hmm. buy everything they've ever put out. And I will try to absorb and steal as much knowledge from them as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, um, not having a traditional education background, I never wanted somebody to ask me, what college did you go to? That was a deep fear of mine that I would get in these circles with all these strength coaches who have master degrees and went to big universities and they would be like, so where'd you go to school? And I'd be like, uh -huh. yeah, school of hard knocks, you know? Um, and that really right. concerned me, you know, but it, it created a compulsion in me to be informed, to be competent. And uh, my first pursuits were all strength and conditioning. I wanted to make sure that it, I really understood the job and everything that went into it and how to move, you know, somebody from where they are to where they want to be. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I realized very quickly that um, I'm also going to need to be as equally as competent, if not more so, in the areas of business, sales, and marketing, if I ever really wanted to build a business. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it's just, I, I reverse engineer things. If I want to learn how to get better at marketing, I start looking out into the world, asking smart people that I know, who are the best marketers? Who puts out the best courses? Who's writing the best books? And then I have a very simple strategy. Buy all of them and okay. then do the work. <laughs> you know, buy all of them, study, do the work, rinse, wash, repeat, and keep doing that over and over and over again. You do that for a decade or more and you, and you wake up one day and you realize like, man, I kind of know some stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I think an important thing that I've been sharing with people lately is not just being a consumer of information. If I had, if I had made any error in this process, it's not. A I had an addiction to consumption. You know, yeah, it's like, eh? I needed to read it all, know it all. Like if you told me about a book, I'm buying the book and I'm reading the book. There was no way for me to go, hmm. Will this help me be better today? Yeah. Is this applicable to the environment that I'm working in? Yeah. And um, so I've gotten a lot more critical of how I approach continuing education as I've gotten older. Um, but in the beginning, it was like, see books, see courses, see videos, buy them all, watch them all, study them all. And uh, that, that certainly worked. It's got some value, um, but it can lead you astray at times too. You know, I think consumption of information is a great way to distract yourself from actually doing work. And uh, there are a lot of people in our world, um, I'm fortunate to talk to a lot of business owners and strength coaches, that they, they fall into that trap. They need to know everything. And they're so consumed with knowing everything that they're not doing anything how how would you um let's say with all that information that you have what what process that you go through so that you're able to make to to use that information and make it in an applicable way yeah i think making sure it's the right information is first right so pre-framing a learning experience by asking yourself how will i use this is important to okay. get your brain to start thinking about, okay, where does this information fit into my business in my life? Okay. Uh, you may find you don't need to study things just, just by going there. Okay. But then for me, it, you know, 
I, I read, I take notes and I reflect. And this is something that, you know, I've shared with you and others, but yeah. after reading and studying material, what I do a lot of times, I'll just pull up my phone uh, on a video. Yeah. I will just communicate into that video what I've learned and mm -hmm. actually not just what I've learned, but how it's applicable to my, my current state and my current experience. Mm -hmm. And then how can I use that information? So it's just always, uh, like kind of putting a marker in my brain that says, this is how I'm going to use this information. This is how it's relevant to my experience. Um, and then teaching it after that. Right. So I've okay. studied it. I've taken notes on it. I've reflected on uh, how applicable it is. And then if it, if it makes that cut, then I teach it to my team, staff, or someone close to me. That way it gets deeper ingrained into me. I see. Okay. A lot of different ways uh, to make sure that things are ingrained into you, but, but that's one of the more effective strategies that I've leaned on over the years. Well, that's a good practice. That's a practical way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And I hope people will take, note, take notes about it because that's some, that's a good tip. Really yeah. good. Yeah. So, you know, I remember the first zoom call that we had together and we spoke like you really caught my attention when you said people don't have business problems. They have personal problems. And yeah. can, you, can, can you elaborate on that? Yeah. I mean, I just, in my experience talking to a lot of business owners, a lot of times they, they're clear on what they need to do. Mm -hmm. um, they even have ideas on how to get that done, but they're not doing it because of some other area of their life that's not in control. Mm -hmm. um, specifically in the strength coach world, there's a lot of guys that like they look in shape, but they're burnt. Their capacity is very low just from working really long hours and kind of celebrating the grind. Okay. So they may not have a business problem. They may have a capacity problem or they actually need to work on their health so okay. they have more energy to put into their business. Okay, I see. Um, a lot of people have relationship problems. And that, that isn't always necessarily with a significant other, but that's probably the most common. But a lot of guys just have really poor relationships with themselves. Okay. And uh, that creates a lot of self-limiting beliefs. Mm. Uh, starting and stopping syndrome. They're always getting ready to get ready. And uh, that can keep them from actually growing a business or uh, having success in some area of this field that they're attached to. And a lot of us need to work on our relationship with ourselves, and we need to look into our, you know, significant other ish relationships that I would include all types of family, girlfriends, you know, and ask ourselves, like, are we really managing those in a way that serves us? Yeah. Um, because relationships are tricky and they're, they're very complex. And they can uh, empower you, or they can disempower you. Mm, I see. Okay, I see. That's that's a really that's really good. I understand now. So, fr from the beginning, uh, I like you. We can see that like you're big on setting values for yourself, and also like setting. You, I I know. See, you, you're you're big on setting values also for your business. Um, how does defining your values have helped you become a better person, but also help you build a better business? So I think values a lot of times are aspirational for people like you in order to figure out your values, you kind of have to look outwards at people that you respect. Okay. Try to get clear on what their values are and, and then start emulating them. The thing about values is they should drive specific behaviors. Okay. So if you know the type of man that you want to be, it's pretty easy, not simple to reverse engineer what those behaviors should be and what they should look like in action. I think that's a really important thing for people to consider is, am I living and showing up in a way that's actually congruent with the values that I say I live by? And I would take that one step further and say, most people, in my experience, haven't put a lot of thought into this. They haven't even clarified, are these my values? Because we absorb values from family, friends, media, uh, and a host of other ways. So I think the first step is like getting clear on what do you stand for? Mm -hmm. And then what does that look like in action? And then holding yourself accountable to that um, in a non-negotiable way. If you, if you really stand for something, there shouldn't be compromise. And listen, I, we're all human. We're going to make mistakes. Um, but that should be the focus. And then in regards to business, it, again, you have to be clear on what you stand for as an organization. And then what type of behaviors are you trying to drive in your business? And you have to make sure that everybody on the staff understands you know, the requirements relative to these values. What does it look like in action? But also, what does it look like when somebody's not living that value? Mm -hmm. And in regards to both your personal and business values, I think that's an incredibly important place to start. You need to look like, what does it look like 
not being lived at the highest level. That way you're really clear on what the contrasting view of this value would be. Mm-hmm. And then it's a lot easier for you to figure out what should it look like in action. Okay, so you have to see them both. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. I see. Yeah. So, um, so, it's fun, cause I'm, so you said, okay, you have to look up to other people, but how do you, how, how would I say this? How do you make sure that you, is, that you, can't, you don't take a value, but you just take it just because it looks nice, but it's really yourself? Because yeah. you know how some people that say, like, um, I remember you told me, like, a, um, a story. I don't know if it's you, but there was a story about um, somebody putting a tattoo. But it's probably, it's, it's not probably, it's not the right action to say that you really represent those values. Yeah. So how do you yeah. make sure that it's, like, really authentic? Yeah, self-awareness. I mean, I think we are great at telling stories to protect our egos. Mm-hmm. And um, people will say that they stand for all types of things. Uh, but you you don't see that in how they're showing up. Mm -hmm. So I think the key to that is self-awareness. And even with like a lot of the current events we have going on right now, I think are um, indicative of how detached people are. You know, I think we we have to do a better job of identifying what do we really stand for and then making our behaviors congruent with that. Mm -hmm. And you know, the cool thing about this is that I think it was – a question that is, that is said at the right time because at this time since we have like kind of like a pandemic it's like a good time to just sit down and just as you said be self-aware and say you know what what are my values and what do what do i stand for yeah, yeah. and do i really live that like mm-hmm. it's easy to shout from the mountaintops what you stand for and make these long you know emotional posts on social media but do you really live it like that's the thing are you questioning your biases um, are you looking deep into how you show up and act and not what you think how you act um, because i think that is the key to figuring out what you value it's behaviors not words it's how you show up it's how you act that's well said so uh, i remember also from from um from the time that i've been with you um, your approach with business, like you say it from your mantra, it's like you serve first and you sell later. You sell later, sorry. Yeah. So what is the fine line between giving a service for free and putting a price for your service? Because sometimes like, it seems like it's either one pole or the other. It's like, oh, okay, uh, I'll do this for free. Or it's like, no, I w- I'm putting a price on it. And yes, yeah, either it's either or it's, it's not like a, there's no in between. Yeah, there seems to be two camps in that. Uh, area. Um, to me, it's very contextual. I, th- I think there are times in your career uh, where you have to be uh, very clear about what your boundaries are. And um, But most people should do a lot more free work, in my opinion. Okay. Free work helps you get reps. And early on, I know your focus on as a coach is like getting paid, getting paid, getting paid. For me, I always felt like I needed to prove to people I was worthy of what I was then going to charge them at some point. Like in my mind, I knew I was going to be a top-notch guy, charge top-notch prices, Mm -hmm. uh, but I needed to get some buy-in first. I needed to show people what I could do, how I could impact people. So, I mean, I've done uh, an absurd amount of free work, and Mm -hmm. I don't think it's taken away from my earning potential at all. Um, I think it's helped me connect with people. I think it is shown that I'm willing to prove who I am and who I say I am and what I'm capable of uh, before I ask for money. And that may not be a very uh, entrepreneurial sales guru thing. Yeah. But again, it's about my values, right? So it was, that was a value driven decision. And, you know, I, I still do free work. You know, I, I still do it to this day, but I also have no problem asking for the money that I, that I know I deserve when it's appropriate. But you know the cool thing with that is, you said like it didn't really affect you. It's, it it would have been cool if you just went to the lobby of the gym just to see how many people, how many athletes that you've trained, and some of them being in the pros, and well, how how much you've had an impact in your community with doing some of the free stuff that you did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we've, we've worked with hundreds of kids. I mean, um. You know, some of the kids that we've scholarshiped over the years are now professional athletes. Uh, they, they come back and they still give back to this community and they give back to our facility by still training here. And that's been uh, incredibly powerful. Um, so, I mean, doing free work and giving people opportunity who may not have it otherwise, I, I think is a very worthwhile thing. And, and I, I have a hard time understanding people that uh, don't see it that way. 
Mm-hmm. You know, I think if you can give people an opportunity to get better, um, if they truly can't afford it, and, and let's be real, there are a lot of people who simply can't afford services yeah. like this. True. I think, I think that's a, a worthwhile venture. And um, I, I see no negatives to it at all. And uh, it's just, it's confusing to me how other people feel about that situation. You see, well, yeah. so um, as a business, so as a businessman, you've been doing this for a lot of times so, that, well, you have to wear multiple hats, meaning like you have to take care of the, well, you have to look at the accounting, you have to look out for the marketing. And when is the right time to consider delegating a task? Because, you know, let's say you at this stage, you could say that you could you could delegate some stuff, but I get, I guess most of the stuff you 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 decide to keep as a task. But some like some people, let's say um, they're at the beginning, they might have they might not have the money, but they might not be that skilled in doing marketing or, or some stuff from business. So I think as soon as you realize you're competent enough to assess how well someone else is doing the job. Okay. I think that's the short answer is um, when you really know training, it's easy for you to then assess a trainer's ability to run your training system and program. Okay. Mm-hmm. But the same holds true for your, like your CRM system of how you manage your customers. The same holds true for social media. Like you don't have to do all these things and entrepreneurs should be doing the things that give them the highest ROI. And that's usually finding your unique ability. Like, what are you great at? What is your one thing? Mm-hmm. And like, so for me here at BCI, my, I believe like my superpower, my unique ability uh, is connection. Yeah. And I connect with athletes when they walk in this building. I also developed, uh, you know, pretty much everything that we do here. So I'm the authority on those things. So when I, we sit down with people in what we call intake interviews uh, before they sign up with us, that's my role. It's to meet every person, to pre-frame their experience, to set expectations, and, and help them see how their goals are attached uh, to working with us or how we can help them uh, with those goals to be more specific. So I think that's the thing is figuring out your unique ability, yeah. uh, becoming competent at everything so you can assess uh, how well somebody is doing that you, that you may hire. But, uh, but I, I'll say this. I think if you're a strength coach, getting like the customer relationship management stuff out of your hands fast is a good idea. I do not think you should be doing your own books and trying to do your own taxes. Get that stuff out of your hands first. Okay. So once you've got those things out, then, then you can start focusing on what other things to strip back, but it takes a while in my experience working with business owners to get them past that point. Uh, In fact, it takes a long time to talk a lot of business owners into just not doing their own books uh, they don't want to invest the money in that. Um, but you, it's funny how when you when you make a decision that you're going to give up doing something, how you end up finding a way to make the money. Yeah. But if you never make the decision, it's very easy to get caught in that story that because you're the owner, you have to do everything. You go to a lot of continuing education, some mentorship. And from what I've seen, like you, you're able to build like strong relations, strong relationships with like other great strength coaches in the industry, like you, like Mark Fisher, uh, Luca Hasselbar, but most importantly, like you, you're able to build strong relationship with your athletes, even after they're done with their sports. Um, could you just like, how did you build like a strong relationship like that with strong co- like coaches that are well, like kind of world renowned and your athletes? Yeah. I mean, I think the answer to, to both of those situations, like building relationships with coaches and building relationships with athletes is the same. It starts with like really caring about building a relationship. Mm-hmm. You know, I think a lot of guys, when they go to build relationships with strength coaches who may sit in high places, mm-hmm. it's a very one-sided deal. It's like, Hmm, that guy can do a lot for me. That guy can help me uh, make my name more well-known in this industry. Yeah. Um, it's a very selfish thing as for me, it's always been about like, all right, I respect this guy. He's really good at stuff. I'm going to keep investing in his work. And then if I continuously do that, I'm going to have an opportunity to invest in the person, you know? So years later, if you are constantly investing in someone else's work, you're going to build a legitimate rapport with them. 
Yeah. And then if you have opportunities to get close to them and kind of like both humanize each other by way of like going to continuing uh, education events and sharing a beer or a meal that creates real bonding capital, but it, but it starts with the, the true intention to invest in them without worrying about how it's going to benefit you. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing with athletes. I, you know, a lot of the successful athletes we have here, people try to give me credit for a lot of their success. And I'm the first person to say, nah, like, no, it's not me. They, they did the work, you know, they, they've done the work. And I, and those athletes know that, right? They know I cared about them first. I cared about their dream. I cared about them being successful. It wasn't really about how it could impact me, even though my association with a lot of those athletes certainly benefits me that, that uh, was never the intent, you know, it was really just like, I want to serve and I want to help these guys and I want to help them see their dreams through. But that's well, that's well said because when you think about it, um, they already have the motive. Well, they they already have the motivation, the drive, and you're just making, you're just guiding the drive to get where they want to go. Yeah. So, so it's like let's say, um, it's, like, it's just it's like uh, being like the Google Map, and you just they do the action to go towards the the, the destination. Yeah, you're you're the you're the facilitator in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. Like facilitator, yes. Facilitating their growth, you're. Uh, providing con uh, like context relative to your experience uh, in and out of you know the weight room, and I, I think it's a really powerful thing. But I, I, we are in this world now where like everybody's trying to take credit for other athletes, mm-hmm. and um, athletes sniff that out. They can tell the difference between somebody who's invested in the person and somebody who's just trying to benefit from the notoriety of working with that athlete. Mm-hmm. As a coach, you have there's there are some challenges in like. Um, having relation like a, a kind of like a, a relationship with the athletes, but also when it comes to building trust um, in your career as a strength coach, like what was like some of the challenge that you had to have trust with your athletes and to trust like the process? Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I haven't struggled with that a lot. No, oh. no, I haven't. Um, I think we do a lot of work up front to get athletes bought in the way we communicate our program and our expectations. Uh, you know, there, there's, I can't think of an incident off the top of my head. Now, I, I've been coaching for a really long time. So I'm sure there's something that uh, I'm forgetting, but we, we really haven't had a lot of issues with that. Okay. Um, at times I will say there, there becomes like, if you've been working with somebody for eight to 10 years, yeah. th- there is that dichotomy of leadership where you can all, you can be too close. And that, that can impact your ability to maybe pull them out of a rut or make them see where maybe they're not showing up in a way that you would expect them to show up. But, but you just have to have the courage to confront those things regardless and uh, remind them of the expectation set and the path in which you're working together. So to prevent, to have, well, I'm not saying just to gar- have guarantee, but in another way, you have to in the beginning, when you first start with building that relationship with that person, you can, you kind of have to set the expectation off the, off the gate. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. If you set the expectations up ahead of time, um, everybody knows the deal. So it's, it's either you're living by it or you're not. It Mm -hmm. doesn't mean somebody's not going to fall off course. That's a, it's a very common thing, but when they fall off course, now you have the ability to remind them about the expectations that you set coming in. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways to do that. As I said, like you invested in a lot of continuing education to a point that you've decided to build your own mentorship to help strength coaches. Uh, what have you seen? Um, what What have you seen was missing that you wanted to uh, fill up? Uh, well, I think the thing I don't know if it was something that was missing more so is like the common way that strength coaches, sport performance coaches, and personal trainers are marketed to is all about like, let me teach you how to make a hundred thousand dollars a month. Right. Mm -hmm. Like everybody's always dangling the money. Right. And I understand that's really important. I get it. And there are a lot of people that are, are really driven by money. Like that's their, their end game. But for me, I believe strongly there are other guys out there that want to make good money, but dangling money in front of them is not what entices them. What entices me as a coach is the impact that I can have on a community and the freedom that I can use my business to create for myself so I can spend more time with my family 
and participate in all the other things that I'm passionate about. So that was my position. I'm going to teach people how to build lifestyle and business systems that allow them to have freedom and money to live the type of life that they want to live. Um, but it's never been about, let's just increase your EFT by 15 K this month. Yeah. That's actually a relatively easy thing to do for a lot of people. Um, especially if you've done the work and you've got good position in your market, like that's not that hard to do. Um, it is hard to sustain that 15 K over the course of a year or a couple of years, but it's, it's relatively easy to get it on the front end. Mm -hmm. you know, so my thing is I wanted to teach people how to keep their money, how to use the money to leverage freedom for themselves. And I realized like not everybody wants that. There are some people that want to work in their business all day, every day. And I, and I respect that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I'm 20 years into this thing and you know, I don't want to coach from 5 AM to 8 PM at night anymore. That, that's not for me. I, I want to be able to go to my daughter's games and um, daddy daughter dances. And I want to be able to go have lunch with her when I want, I want to be able to take her to school, pick her up from school. Um, you know, me and my wife also in a beauty lounge and uh, it's yeah. relatively new and my wife has to work a lot more. So I, I'm fortunate that I've created the freedom to where I can spend more time with our daughter. And that, you know, just making more money without systems and people in place to provide freedom wouldn't give me the level of fulfillment that I have today. So that, that's the gap that I wanted to fill. I wanted to teach people business and lifestyle systems that would give them freedom from their business mm -hmm. and certainly allow them to make a lot of money, but make it very clear that shouldn't be your main focus. So it's funny because from your answer, my question was like to see it to you, to to explain to to ask like what was like the common question a common mistake but that would that would you say that people like the common mistake of like most strength coaches is that they're not able to live the life that they want because they don't set up systems uh, yeah I, I mean or they don't question how well the current systems they have in place are working for them you know we we get very locked in on like this is the way i was taught to do things so this is the way i do things mm -hmm. and uh if that's not working for you you might want to consider a different way of doing it sure. and, I, and i'd even argue like most strength coaches and trainers that i know that open facilities really the only system they have mm -hmm. is their training system and yeah. often that's not even very well documented mm -hmm. um yeah, and that, that's been my experience. So getting them to put systems in place in other areas that they're less competent in is a real challenge. And, and I understand that. And there's a lot of simple strategies to uh, take a bite out of that elephant one at a time. Mm. I see. Okay, cool. So um, that's, this, that, that, that's the, it's all the questions that I have for you. But uh, if there are people that like to communicate with you, what, what is the best way to, to contact you? Find me on the Instagram. That's where I'm trying to uh, spend more time these days. So it's Andy McCloy underscore BCI. Yeah, right, so cool. they can find me over there. And uh, anybody that wants to uh, reach out by email, it's Andy McCloy at bodycreationsinc.com. All right. Thank you very much, Andy. It's really appreciate to have you. It's been a long time that uh, we didn't talk, but it was good seeing you. Yeah, good seeing you as well. My pleasure. All right, so have a good day. Say hi to Malik. Say hi to Cassidy. Say hi to Kagan. And I will. I will, cool. bro. Thank you. All right, take care, eh? All right, dude. See ya. Yeah.